Howdy. Hi, how are you? Doing well. So, so Tara, you have quite a pedigree. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some shout outs for this stuff because this is cool. Even though most, I asked you not to. Most creative people in business by Fast Company, named as a woman to watch by Advertising Age, named as 40 Under 40 by Cranes. That's, that's pretty impressive. But all that aside, the reason I'm excited to talk to you today is because of the position that you sit in where you've got some perspective that, that we may not have because heading up the agency team in the US for Google and YouTube, you kind of get to see it all. You get to see the data from Google's side and all of the information, all the fantastic information you have access to. And you also get to see how agencies are applying that. Mm -hmm. So within the theme of today's summit, how do you define the new value equation between brands and consumers? And where does Google sit inside that definition? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And this might be a recency bias, I guess, but <laughs> Jeremy's remarks this morning about the expectation economy really resonated with me strongly because what we see when we look across the ecosystem is that people are just craving assistance, right? Their expectation is that you will help them in whatever moment they're in with as much speed and relevance and personalization and immediacy as possible. And so that, that means that you have to understand them. And in particular, you know, we believe you have to understand their intention. Right? And you know, together, I mean, together with everyone in this room, that was a bit intention and understanding. It was a big part of what made search so powerful in the beginning. And I think what's interesting now is that intention is everywhere and you can access it. I mean, thanks to mobile, it's in apps, it's in local, it's in all sorts of platforms that never had it before. And you know, we think, given our history, that that's a place where we can help. And, and frankly, as we've seen, uh, given yours, a place where you help too. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the term that you used last week to describe it was ambient search. And that really resonated with me. I think it's kind of the evolution of micro moments. And mm -hmm. you know, that, that gives us more opportunities to get in front of people, to be relevant. But that also makes me think back to something that Sam said just a, a little bit ago in his session, talking about the convergence of brand and direct response. So as, you know, as performance marketers, we like that story, right? It gets us a larger piece of the pie. But <laughs> Really, what does it mean for marketers? And is it possible to do that well? Does it make sense to try and bring those two things together? Can those two things complement each other? Honestly, I mean, I think those things have always coexisted, right? So I came actually more from the brand side of the house when I walked into Google seven years ago and everyone was talking about brand and performance as such discrete buckets. And I thought to myself, like, this is kind of strange. Mm -hmm. And years later, I sort of understood the ecosystem and how that, that grew up. At that time, I was thinking about things like if you think about television, you know, retail, telco, a lot of those folks for years have done what we would call brand and performance in the same spot. But I think the media had limitations, both the traditional media and ours that made these very, very separate, right? And so, you know, in search, we never made it easy to see impressions or use impressions in a way that brand marketers were used to using. Mm -hmm. In video, you know, television networks couldn't deliver the same kind of conversion information or insight that digital could. And now some of those constraints are, are going away. And I think that's what makes it not only possible, but actually imperative that people think about these things together. And, and the biggest example I would give you is actually something that many of you in this room asked for for a very, very long time, that it took us several years to have the consumer consent to do properly. Uh, but it was to use what we know about people's intentions in search, in maps, in apps, in video. And so last fall, we launched Advanced Audiences, which lets you do just that. And it was the beginning, I think, of an eye-opening for a lot of our partners, a lot of our clients, to how these two things could come together. And, and the performance was as powerful as people expected. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's those kinds of opportunities that we'll continue to build on that makes it possible and, and frankly, a lot easier than it ever was before to do these things together well. And I think the, the, the one missing piece that we'll request of you on that is, please help us figure out media mix modeling. When our clients come to us with a media mix modeling thing that says, stop investing in search. I mean, I, we've talked about that. I know that's, but <laughs> I think okay. I can think of a few people in the room that have asked for that. <laughs> good, good data leads to good models. Tell them you want to make sure that, that we all agree we have the best data in the media mix modeling and we will help with that. It's, you guys have pushed us hard on this. Many of our clients have. It's changing a long entrenched multi-partner system, but, mm -hmm. but we recognize the challenge and have a lot of best practices on how we can, we can work with you to, to do that. So I actually want to next pivot away from Google and AdWords and actually talk about something that a lot of people don't realize or don't think about often is that Google is the world's largest search engine, 
but Google also sort of owns this world's second largest search engine, depending on how you measure it, when we're talking about YouTube. Mm -hmm. And as, as a search marketer, I've always wanted to do more with YouTube, but as someone who historically is a, you know, search marketer, I go into YouTube and I first thing I say is, where are my damn keywords? Like, <laughs> how come I can't target like that? So can you tell us a little bit about how you've been evolving very recently YouTube's targeting methodology and advertising methodology to take what is, I think, historically been more of a branded focus and bring it back towards the performance lens? Sure. I and mean, I think part of it actually has to do with, as, as you were mentioning, sort of the targeting that's actually available on the platform. And it builds off of the, uh, the advanced audiences launch that we did last fall that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. But what we are launching now, and, and iProspect has really been at the forefront with us in terms of helping us shape this and helping to get a few of you ahead of the curve in, in getting it going, is custom intent audiences. And what that really does is it lets you customize against your familiar and friendly keywords for targeting on YouTube. So brands are able to pick the products they're searching for, or your branded terms, or, or other um, you know, non-branded search terms that you think are relevant in order to inform both what you are saying and who you are saying it to on YouTube. And we think that's game changing. The, the results that we've had so far back that up. Mm -hmm. I think this is as important a revolution for performance marketers as search was originally and, and mobile was next. And it's what, what I like about it is just what you were talking about earlier. Google has so much data on intent. And one of the things that I've really seen from Google over the past year, really, um, since uh, Google Marketing Next event last year, is Google taking all of these disparate properties where people interact with your systems and starting to build those gaps so that we can yep. share audience lists between channels so that we can, because consumers are moving. I, I mean, I'm deep in the Google ecosystem. I, I always, and, and which means that any time that we're doing a Hangout, I have to log out of my Gmail so I can use my work address. But that's neither here nor there. Um, it's but, like this all day long, relentlessly advocating on either his or your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> so, so looking at uh, custom intent audiences and yep. some of the other targeting capabilities and being able to optimize for more performance-based metrics on YouTube, can you, can you share some results of brands that have leaned into this and are, are doing it well? Yeah, and I think you, know, you touch on, on two things. We talked a little bit about the targeting, which enables some of the performance marketing to be more compelling. There's also a format element to it, right? Mm -hmm. So many of you are probably familiar with traditional TrueView, which was, at its time, an innovation in that it was launched on a you only pay if they see the whole ad basis. But you could really only optimize against views. And that was much more of a branding metric. Brand surveys were run against it, things like that. But based on feedback from iProspect and others, we launched a series of objectives that you can actually now optimize TrueView against. Everything from a CPM-based format that lets you essentially go after cost-efficient reach, very cleverly called TrueView for reach, uh, to being able to launch, again, and optimize against a whole variety of, of actions. So if you've got conversion tracker set up, you can action against any of those things that you're tracking already. Other people are doing it against things like store visits. And that's opened up a, a real world of opportunity for people to be able to understand what's working and to drive business results as a function of that understanding. So to your question about, well, who's doing that well? There, there are a couple things that pop to mind. One is folks who are really rethinking how they think about products. And so the, the company that comes to mind is Hawaiian Airlines. So Hawaiian Airlines actually started doing a campaign where they were using the information about people who were Googling search information about Hawaiian vacations. And they were using that to actually determine the campaign on YouTube to drive straight to bookings. And the campaign actually doubled the bookings that they were having when they were using search alone and cut the CPA in half. And what I love about it is they framed that back to us as they were using search for awareness and video for performance, which was really a flip from, wow. yeah, from That's how, wild. yeah, wild, right? So I think people were really able to open their minds about how they think about product as sort of one bucket of, of mm -hmm. brands who are doing it well. I think there's a second piece, which is brands who are really thinking cleverly about creative. And so uh, there was a, an example, I don't know if anyone saw it, but Net-A-Porter, one of the biggest luxury online retailers, had this insight that a lot of their customers were 
very into exclusivity and also total impulse buyers. And as a shopper on Ada Parte, I did wince a little bit when I saw that description because it, it resonated. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> they launched a campaign using the ability to, to target against conversions that had creative, that literally had a countdown clock in the video. And it had an exclusive offer. It was basically a flash sale for you in the ad in that moment that after that was gone that absolutely blew apart their, their online sales metrics. And I just thought that was clever. You know, it's sort of the next generation of, you remember how Geico was famous for that, like, don't skip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was like the convert now ad of the moment. And I thought that was, that was a cool example. And then the very last thing is just people who are being really smart and really clever with the targeting opportunities available. And, and frankly, you know, you guys have several of these. Um, the, the clients that pop to mind are you know, Hollister, mm -hmm. Gucci. I think there were a couple others who saw better results on click-through rate with mm -hmm. these new targeting capabilities than they've seen in any of their other methods, including, as we heard earlier from Jeremy with some sarcasm, but not really, the gold standard of retargeting, yeah. right? So I, I think those are the three areas, you know, thinking about product with an open mind, really being clever about creative and using the targeting wisely that, that have jumped out to me so far. Awesome. And you know, the, so first of all, thank you for the shout out. We're definitely proud of the work that we've been doing jointly with our clients and we're looking forward to doing more case studies later. But what really surprised me is the net a uh, example, because to me, I mean, it sounds like you're almost taking the home shopping network idea and turning it into a commercial on YouTube, which is not a trend that I saw coming back around. But if it works, it works. <laughs> well, here's the thing that I found really interesting and somewhat surprising. So one of the things that we did, it wasn't necessarily aimed at performance per se, but as we've just discussed, the brand and performance you know, worlds are colliding. Mm -hmm. We launched six second ads as a function of user experience. And this was probably a little over a year ago. And we did it because we could see in the behavior that people in many moments, right? Think about particularly on mobile, 60% of YouTube is still on, on mobile viewing. Um, not when you're waiting for the bus, when you're you know, trying to focus on me and Jeremy. Uh, you, know, you, you don't always have all the time for a 30 second ad. And so we launched these six second ads because that's what we saw the tolerance for. And they're pretty hardcore, right? Like they get in, they make a message, they get out. And I. Candidly, again, coming from the brand side of the house, I was a little bit skeptical about whether they could be impactful, but they are showing up as tremendously powerful. And what we're seeing is having a very clear, very discreet offer, which feels a little either home shopping-esque or DRTV-esque, is working really well on YouTube. And so there is a little bit, I think, of what's, what's old is new again there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's fascinating. So, you know, you've, we've talked about this. Um, I'm obviously very excited about custom intent audiences because it's essentially search retargeting. Whatever people searched on Google, taking that keyword and that intent and being able to reach that individual person. I mean, it's personalization that's cross channel. So, you know, based on that, uh, you know, I'm sold. Let's get all of our clients on that. It seems to be an easy win, but it, it, in, in actuality, it seems like a lot of times when we go to market, it's not quite that easy. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the barriers that you've seen have been and how Google is addressing those and making, kind of making it easier to say yes? Sure. So I think there are two primary barriers. One is overcoming sort of traditional biases against video as a performance vehicle. And that, honestly, we're just trying to continue to work with our partners and with clients to continue to show the results because that's what will get people there. Mm -hmm. I think it, did, it does require this level of targeting and leaned in experience to make video a powerful performance vehicle. And so for people who looked at it five, eight, 10 years ago, you know, there are biases that we have to get past. I think that's actually the easier one, to be honest, especially mm -hmm. because the results are so strong. The more difficult one is creative. And so a lot of folks are very intimidated by the creative challenge, to which I'd say we're trying to do two things. One is, if you have access to no creative at all, or if you're a client who has no creative at all, we are, we've offered a, a suite of either solutions or connections that make it easy to get some, right? So in this day and age, there are networks of professional videographers who will make great, fast, relatively inexpensive creative and are doing incredibly well with that. And there are ways that, that we connect you to them in order to find a good match. The other thing is for folks who are a little more sophisticated, who need lots and lots of iterations, we launched a product called Director Mix, which makes it very easy and very fast and very cost effective to get a whole slew of creative explosions automatically that you can then target against what you're doing. My guess would be in this room, people would have a much more intuitive interest in that than they do in a lot of the branding mm -hmm. areas because it's not tremendously different from what you have experienced and seen work in search and display so effectively. Um, the last thing I would say is also, and I, I, I cringe a tiny bit when I tell the example of net a -Porte because I don't want to scare people about creative. That's, that is a quirky, one-off, awesome mm -hmm. uh, idea, but it's, it's not 
necessary that every idea be like that. And so the other example I'll throw out there is a lot of folks are starting with their TV creative and using that as a performance vehicle. So Lyft, as an, for an example, had some great branding spots that they tested on YouTube with the, the conversion overlay against it, against their more performance-oriented spots. And they basically found they performed just as well. And so there was a distribution of the branding spots. A couple of them actually were the top performers, outperforming even the, the intended conversion spots. You know, a couple of them didn't perform as well. And they just optimized against that as a mix. But it was, it's a good validation that if you're looking for a place to start, start with what you got. You know, and that kind of comes back to one of the running themes throughout today, which is listen to your customers. Like, yeah. you can predict and you can analyze and you can say, this is meant for this. But if people are responding to it in a different way, take advantage of that. I think that's actually uh, absolutely right. And it's funny because we, we hit this a lot for uh, people's perceptions of content, right? So people get very worked up and, you know, again, particularly again in the branding space, they have an idea of what premium content is and it looks like this is us. And it does not necessarily look like a how-to video on, you know, installing your television. But, uh, you know, we're living in a day where people are the gatekeepers, not networks. And that fundamentally changes what they are watching and where they are watching, which we can all see in the data. And that's true for ads as well. And so I think you're, you're spot on, which is both leaning into what people are saying and doing and, you know, again, what performance marketers have always done so well, which is test, experiment, and optimize until you've got what works. I mean, that is going to be an enormous asset, I think, in the, in the marketing road ahead. And I think I just want to underline uh, director's mix as, as a really cool feature because in paid search, it's, I've always felt like in paid search, Yes, half the value is driving performance. We have to drive KPIs, we have to drive ROI, but paid search is also the world's largest ongoing consumer survey. And being able to just bounce different pieces of creative across each other, and Google is giving us tons more tools to be able to do that at scale using machine learning. But be able to take that mentality over into produced video creative and swapping out the assets and using director mix to, to be able to facilitate that without overtaxing and uh, yeah. a stressed out creative team is, is incredibly powerful. That's exactly the goal. So. You know, going back to where we started, um, you, you sit in an interesting position where you're able to see a lot of data and a lot of interesting trends. Um, I know that you really, you and your team really like digging into that. Uh, wanted to see if there were any particular trends that surprised your team. I know there was an initiative not long ago where you looked at 400 plus ads to figure out like which ones were really resonating with people and what was working and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. was, was there anything else in the data other than like the six second, you know, identification that surprised you or jumped out at you? I mean, a lot of the other things that, that came out of that particular analysis were a little bit more what you would expect in terms of either they were things that make any great spot compelling, right? They created an emotion, they made you laugh, they were clear, whatever. Or uh, things that were more specific to what works well in a digital or mobile environment, right? They were cropped more tightly, the use of music, things like that. I will tell you what, what has surprised me recently is looking at some of the data, and it's funny, you, you referenced YouTube as the number two search engine in the world, which everybody, including me, sometimes forgets, because I, I sort of think about the fact that everybody knows people go to search before they make decisions about what products to buy. But I just saw data come out literally this morning that startled me in terms of how much people are going to YouTube to make decisions before what products to buy. I mean, they were, had things in there that showed that you know, one in two millennials were actually going online and looking at food prep videos before deciding what food to actually go buy at the supermarket or to buy online through their online vendor. They were showing that something like 95% of gamers watch a YouTube video about gaming or about the gaming products before they will buy one. 85% of sports fans watch a YouTube related video before a related sports purchase. One in two folks for a car purchase. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And I guess maybe that shouldn't have surprised me, but frankly, the magnitude of it did. Well, in my own um, unofficial survey of eight-year-olds who live in my house, uh -huh. uh, YouTube has an incredible influence on purchase decisions with like Hobby Kids TV and FT Jeepers and all these unboxing videos, which are somehow so entrancing. Entrancing enough that my daughter has been wanting to emulate them and like make videos of her playing with her toys and then say, how many likes did I get? And I'm like, I'm not posting that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, we, we could have our eight-year-olds compare notes because mine have had a few they wanted to post also. Uh, <laughs> all right. so. This is the part of the presentation where I make Michael Kaplan nervous. Well, that'll be fun. I like making Michael Kaplan nervous. <laughs> so we're up here. We're talking about branding. We're talking about performance. We're also talking about YouTube. And YouTube as a platform, as an advertising platform, has had some challenges over the past year. Um, there's been a lot of press, some negative, some I think justified. Others, quite frankly, I personally think not quite as justified. 
but Google has also been, been forced into a position where you've had to respond to a lot of that very, respond to what are some of the issues, but then also proactively restructure your approach to being the gatekeeper for all of this user-generated content and all of these you know, millions of hours of videos that are uploaded all the time and figuring out how to monetize against those in a way that is brand safe, that is respectful of creators. I mean, we were talking earlier about ethics and AI. Um, then it becomes a question, okay, what's ethics in a video hosting platform? So that's, that's a lot of tough decisions and a lot of things that go outside of just creating a piece of software or website that, that runs seamlessly and is fun to use for a user. So can you talk a little bit about how Google has addressed those yeah. concerns, uh, just really in the past six months especially? Sure, and I think you, you coined it well when you said, you know, we'd had to react to a lot of things. And I think when I think about the last 12 plus months, you know, I think we all wish that we had been more proactive from the start and less reactive. And that's something I think, you know, we've apologized for publicly many times because while I think there are and will continue to be in a digital world of open platforms, difficult decisions going forward, there were some decisions that should have been easier and we should have moved faster. What I feel good about is, to your point, and you kindly jumped us forward to the last six months, is we announced a pretty dramatic series of changes in the beginning of the year mm -hmm. that I think fundamentally change how we approach brand safety on the platform and how our clients have responded to what we're doing. And they basically fall into three, plat three areas. The first was we embrace the idea that monetization is a privilege and not a right. And so it used to be the case that virtually anyone could monetize content on YouTube. And I think we got roiled in sort of the issues of we didn't want to be free speech monitors, like a whole slew of things, which we then realized doesn't necessarily need to tie to monetization. And so you know, we, like most businesses, get 80% of our view time from you know, a much smaller proportion of our creators who have content that are much more appealing to advertisers. And so one of the biggest things we did is we essentially rewrote the rules to the YouTube Partner Program, which is what makes you eligible for monetization, to essentially focus in on monetizing only, effectively only that smaller portion who could meet a series of uh, litmus tests around both subscribers and watch time that made it much more difficult for anybody to game the system. Because what was happening at that point, we had gotten after the things like violent extremism yeah. pretty quickly, but there were spammers and other people like that that just had unappealing content that, that were getting through the original gates that we'd put up. And even if you flag them and kick them off, they could just like create another account. Right. And because there wasn't that barrier they had to reach, they could just jump Exactly. Yeah. But now with the, you know, I think it's a thousand subscribers. And mm -hmm. Or 4, 000, anyway, I'll get the exact numbers, but it's high enough subscribers and high enough watch time that you can't fake it. Mm -hmm. And so that has been game changing in terms of what's simply available to be monetized on YouTube. So that was the first bucket. That's step one. That's step one. <laughs> step two, and this was a fan favorite, was we embraced much more heartily the fact that we needed to have human review along with machine review and learning. And again, I think it's, it's turned out, many of you may have seen, we launched a transparency report about a month ago mm -hmm. that showed what content was getting taken down on the platform and how fast. And it shows the need for the machine approach because the scale is just so vast, you literally can't do it with humans. And particularly in the area of violent extremism, something like 92% of what content is being removed is now being removed by machines ahead of a human flag, which is great because it proves that it eventually works. Mm -hmm. But I think what we learned was that early on, both for the judgment in what should we tell the machines to do per the earlier conversations mm -hmm. and for having that additional sense check, we needed humans. And so we did a couple of different things. One is we partnered with 144 NGOs, academics, experts in all of these areas of life that honestly I never thought I would be sitting here discussing and certainly don't make for good uh, mealtime conversation. And part of that is because there are honestly places where we just didn't know. There were, you know, the example I always use is it turned out that young children eating Oreos messily was like kind of a fetish thing. Who knew? So anyway, we worked with 144 folks Rule, now to- Rule 37 on the internet, right? Right. If you can think of it, then someone, eh, yeah, going to go there. Exactly. So, so we got this expertise and guidance to help us have much better guidelines and much better training of the classifiers. We also, for Google Preferred, which is uh, the, uh, our, our sort of premium offering of our most popular content, which is now also our most vetted content, mm -hmm. we actually are putting a human review before a Google Preferred ad runs in front of that content 
every single time. Every single piece every of content? Single, every single piece of content. And how many additional humans does that require? So we committed to hiring up to 10,000. We are almost done. We will be done by Q3. And that's in the US, correct? Uh, they may or may not be locusts okay. in the US, but they're, they're focused. Connected you know, with that. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Wow. So it's, it's a lot of human review. And the very last thing, and this was part about uh, being proactive and sort of getting in front of it, is we launched something called the Intelligence Desk, which is looking at, OK, what's the new thing that's coming down the pike that none of these 144 experts, nor we, know about? Mm -hmm. So a good example is they're the ones who found the Tide Pod Challenge early. And so they help to contain that on the platform, to get it off the platform, to work with PNG on having counter-programming against it in a way that would not have happened six to 12 months ago. And so they are proactively out there looking all the time for who are the latest bad actors or accidental stupid kids who are trying to do something that societally we would not want. So that's the second bucket. And then the third bucket is really trying to work within the ecosystem to have, give confidence that things are as much improved as we say they are. And so we're working very, very closely with the third parties in this space. In particular, some of you probably work with Double Verify or IAS. Mm -hmm. um, we've now done close to, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be publicly sharing the number, but many, many, many uh, test campaigns, which we're going to be releasing in our June transparency report, mm. um, that verify that we are basically at the, the standard that, that we all said we would try to get to, which was 99% effective, and frankly, much, much more than that against mm. any of the categories that are much more egregious. So that's sort of a whirlwind tour through what has been a much more comprehensive and sort of in-depth set of initiatives that we've taken. But the feedback we've gotten both you know, quantitatively from these third parties and anecdotally from our clients is that they feel like this has been a step change in the right direction and it, it's what has brought back you know, those clients who, who did step off the platform back into the, into the fold. And you know, the, the, the two other things that I saw within all of these, all of this flurry of activity, yes. uh, first of all, switching from reactive to proactive. Yeah. Um, if you haven't read the transparency report that just came out, I would suggest going and taking a look at it because I always used to joke that Google gives you great information and if you spend money with them, they give you even better information, like comparing Google Trends to your AdWords analysis. Yeah. Uh, this is some of the most transparent I've ever seen Google be, yeah. and the numbers are actually very, very encouraging. You, you mentioned that an uh, incredible percentage of them are being flagged by machine learning yeah. and then also by human review, and an even higher percentage of that is happening before a single person watches the video. So it's not like they're catching something a few weeks after it's been up. That, that to me, is incredibly impressive. Um, you know, and I think the, the, the bigger piece of it is just the, this just really shows a commitment. Um, you're the curators of this content in a way, even if you're just hosting it. And by aligning it with ads, you're, you're kind of giving that guarantee that it's going to be a good brand experience and it's going to be in a good spot. There's always going to be bad actors out there. Um, but I think it's a matter of just really providing partnership and then providing transparency and control. So one of the things that I like to see that, I, that is starting to come to play is if you're an advertiser on YouTube, for certain subjects that are not inherently sensitive but could be sensitive, like politics, yeah. you're allowed to, for, you're not going to exclude videos from politics, but you're going to give advertisers the control of whether they're comfortable serving their ads that way or not. And I think, again, I'm not sure I'm supposed to share this, but the, in the recent hubbub, the article that came out, um, one of the things as we were digging into it with you that you called out is the majority of the channels that were flagged actually the advertisers could have not shown their ads there if they just used their settings correctly by partnering with an agency that understands. I mean, honestly, I, I, listen, I, I, think that, I, think, I think that matters. And you and I have talked about this, mm -hmm. I think, because I think there's an element of, of brand safety and then there's an element of sort of brand sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you start to get into the latter, as you guys all know from working with your agencies who understand across all the platforms that, that you're on, this actually is not that new if you've grown up in the digital space. And so making sure that you have expert partners who are willing to spend the time and the energy and the resource around some of these areas that are more preference than they are what I'd call like societal necessity. Um, you know, I, I do think that is a, a critical complement to being happy with your experience in digital and, and obviously also on, on YouTube. And I think the, the other thing that hopefully that brings to you and, and certainly what we're hoping our steps do as well is the ability for you then to be focusing on what matters most about the platform, which is its ability to create great consumer experiences and to drive business results. Because that was one of those things that was most interesting for me about the entire experience is one of the biggest things that our clients were saying to us is, 
you are killing me because A, like either I'm dealing with someone now who wants me off the platform, which means I've turned off one of my biggest sources of acquisition or retention or brand awareness or whatever it is they do. And B, I can't even strategize around that because I'm not spending all my time strategizing around this. So I think the importance of savvy partners combined with you know, are taking these sort of big steps that, that you know, I'm, I'm glad we're taking now, I hope you know, it gives you both that time and that focus back. Well, we're just about out of time. We've covered a lot of content today um, from the convergence of brand and direct response to the new YouTube capabilities to the production capabilities and director's mix. What is it like the couple of sentence summary of if people are intrigued by this and they haven't really thought about YouTube as a performance channel, where do we start? So listen, I think the exciting news is it doesn't take that much to start, <laughs> right? I think if you talk to your account team, and you, you guys, everyone in this room has a partner who has leaned deeply into this and understands and is ahead of the curve. So talk to your account team about the basics, which are essentially, do you have a creative, do you have conversion tracking, and do you have a strategy? And we can work with you all together to sort of get that moving. I think the other thing that's exciting about doing that now is because it is early days, you, know, you really have the ability, I think, both as direct clients and in partnership with iProspect to help us shape this. I mean, Jeremy and his team have given us a lot of feedback to date. We are continuously iterating that you know, they, they have heavily influenced a new leads gen uh, type of TrueView that we are piloting. There's a lot of opportunity here, I think, to, to shape this into what you want it to be in addition to getting the benefits from what is. And the very last that I would leave you with is just Cisco and many other third parties have been saying for a long time that by 2020, video is going to be 80% of the internet traffic out there, period. And so for people who feel like they either got or missed the benefit of being early in search, got or missed the benefit of being early in mobile, I really believe that video is going to be that next big opportunity that for performance marketing or for marketing in general, right, because brand and performance have come together. You know, getting ahead of this early and understanding how to use it to your best advantage is going to be an ongoing and sustainable differentiator for you and, and, and for the customers you serve. And we want to help. Fantastic. All right. Please join me in thanking Tara for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.